Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Fighting on Film. We're very lucky this week to be joined by Jonathan Ferguson, who is Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries. And we are going to be looking at the most recent adaptation of Last of the Mohicans. Jonathan, thanks for coming on. The first thing we always ask guests is, when did you first see the film? Oh, um, I wasn't really allowed to go to the cinema that often, so... And I was just a little bit too early for me to be able to go with my friends and stuff, I guess. Couldn't drive age 13. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure it would have been one of many films that I saw on TV, probably the network premiere uh, with my parents. So not very, not very exciting, but uh, that, that would have been it. Well, I was thinking about it the other day and I, I can't remember the first time I saw it. I'm almost certain I got it out of the library. Wow. At some point when I was around 10. That dates you really badly. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, so it definitely came out of the library and I was like, oh, that's cool. It's got a gun on the front of it. Um, you just know where it's come from, don't you? Um, just many trips <laughs> to the library. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And then I, I think I, have the, I had the VHS of it and then the DVD. It just really captured my imagination as a kid. I thought, this is, this is amazing. Mm. But can you remember when you first saw it, Rob? Well, this is a, I'm the spanner in the works. I'd never <laughs> seen it until Matt mentioned that we were having question. Jonathan on. And he was like, have you seen Last of the Mohicans? And I sort of like was like, what? What? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Michael Mann's other work. Like, Heat is like one of my favourite heist movies. I mean, it's, it's incredible. So to yep, see him it is. do a, a, like a period piece a few years beforehand, it was it was incredible. And I was not disappointed. Where's Studi and both of them, of course? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Being a badass. Mm. Which is a, a great segue into talking about cast, I guess. So we've got Daniel Day-Lewis, who is Nathaniel Hawkeye Poe. And then he's in in uh, Fenimore Cooper's um, book, he's Natty Bumpo. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hilariously, he's credited on Google as Natty Bumpo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is not tr- not correct, but hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> the the films the film the adaptation is is based on the novel Last of the Mohicans, which came out in the eighteen thirties, and there's been I think about a dozen adaptations for screen, mm. going all the way back to like a silent version in nineteen oh nine. Oh wow! And Man's uh, ninety two version is is the most recent, although I think there might have been like a Canadian drama series called Hawkeye that might have been made at some point in the 90s. But anyway, back to the cast. I mean, Daniel Day-Lewis is huge, isn't he? You know, he's in Lincoln, um, Gangs of New York. I mean, this is the first movie I'd ever seen him in. I must admit, never seen a Daniel Day-Lewis movie. Um, My God, this is that is a hell of a thing to admit on a film yeah, podcast. I know, I know, but you got to, haven't you? You know, we're all, you know. Anything, anything for honesty, but damn. One of, that, one of those actors that passed me by, I'm afraid. So then we've got Major Duncan Haywood, um, played by Steve Waddington. He was in The Parole Officer with Steve Coogan, um, one of me and Matt's favourites. Mm-hmm. And he was also in Face, um, a 1995 film, where he starred alongside Damon Albarn. And that's another heist film. He's been in loads of stuff. He, he's, yeah. you know, he's, he's a decent actor. Um, you got Madeline Stowe as, as Cora Monroe. She played um, Julia Moore in We Were Soldiers. Nice little war movie link. Mm. Um, Wes Studi, as John mentioned. Uh, Maurice Roves as uh, Kendall Monroe. Uh, Pete Postlewaite's in there as Captain Beams. He has like a very short piece. There's a lot of actors that are in this. That yeah, got... but he's, abs- he's absolutely metal when he's on screen, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, it's a shame his him. flintlock doesn't work at the end and he just gets clobbered. He um, it does, it does. Occupational hazard, unfortunately. Yeah, exactly. Um, Colm Meany, uh, the Irish actor, is in there, but we, I think most of his scenes got cut ah. completely. Um, and there's a very early appearance for Jared Harris. I thought I heard his voice at one point. Yes, yeah. So he's the he's the lieutenant at the colonial settlement, the Cameron's um, homestead, and he's yeah. calling on everyone to, to join the colonial militia. Oh, that's, and that's him. him. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, I thought I recognised. Yeah, yeah, I recognised the the voice, but I honestly I'd never sort of put two and two together that he was in it. I thought I was hearing things. I honestly I heard his voice and went, my brain went Jared Harris, and when I looked back at the screen, no. <laughs> <laughs> who have I missed? Um, we missed Russell Means. Oh yes, who plays um the last of the Mohicans, literally. Yeah. Um, in Gatchkook. Oh, and uh, Jody May as Alice Munro, the uh, Kennel's younger daughter. There's plenty of other people in there, but you basically either they had scenes cut from the film or they didn't quite. Yeah. There's one or two other names that you go, they were in that? Mm. And you, you just don't click that they're in there. I scoured it looking for Cole Meany because he, he couldn't have disguised Cole Meany, the sort of, he's that yeah. big, bigger than life sort of that character actor. And yeah. I was like, where is he? He's not in this. I was kind of looking no, forward not. to him you know, sending a lot, load of red coats to their death, but it didn't happen. I was, I was looking the forward to that. I've heard of him being in it, and I've seen it uh, at least a dozen times. <laughs> it's, it's, it's weird. It's so weird. So production, I guess, we come on to next. So it was directed by Michael Mann, um, famous for Heat, 1995. Yeah, three years before Heat. Yeah, three years before. And he'd just come off a film called um, Manhunter um, in 1986, and that was a little bit of a bomb. So he took some time off, and he came back strong with this one. Um, it was released in the US on the 25th of September, 92. I waited a few months um, over here. We got it on the 6th of November. It was made for a budget of 40 million and it made 143 million. So it was a big success, really big film at the time. You know, it didn't come out in the summer, but it re- really feels like a summer blockbuster, summer epic. Mm. And I have a retro review this week. First one we've had for a while. And this comes from uh, the Daily Mirror's film reviewer, Pauline McClude. Um, from the 6th of November, 96, the, the day it came out here. War is raging between England and France in the New World. Hawkeye, the adopted son of the last of the Mohicans, falls in love with feisty, headstrong Cora, the daughter of a British officer. After rescuing her and her younger sister from the vicious Huron war captain, Magua, but the psychotic Magua is hell-bent on revenge for his people and he watches them being eliminated. He wants the girls and their bombastic father, Colonel Monroe, dead. And this is where the censors have taken a very liberal view of this truly breathtaking historical epic. Okay, there's no sex and there's certainly no bad language, but the fight scenes are so graphic with the stomach churning scalpings, tomahawks being thrashed around like meat cleavers and bodies being hacked to bits. I'm amazed it's been given a 12 certificate. The story is cliched and somewhat predictable, but it's a fascinating insight into American history. And of course, the gorgeous Daniel Day-Lewis is ever present. Quite the review, the gorgeous Daniel Day-Lewis. He is gorgeous in this. He's got lovely hair. He does. But um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I don't know whether I would call Monroe's character bombastic, but I suppose the film has that sort of standard trope where the British are the baddies, even when they're the goodies in this period. I suppose you come off as rather arrogant. That's kind of a holdover from a lot of the portrayals of this period. So there's there's a lot of... There's a lot of films based in in um, the French and Indian War, the, the 1750s, that were made in like the, the late 30s through to the early 50s, um, and they all have the the, the, in, the British officers in it are always very much of that ilk where they're they're arrogant, um, and it has this sort of like they look down on the colonial sort of thing. Yeah, um, which I thought contrast in this film, I thought that contrasted really interestingly with how the relations between settlers and the Native Americans uh, is actually portrayed because it shows them as quite integrated, um, especially with certain tribes. Obviously, Mm. there was um, lines that were drawn between, you know, French and and British tribes that were, that were supportive. Um, I just, I found that really interesting and and quite a, it's quite balanced. It's quite, it's quite an intricate sort of depiction, you know, the the shown playing Native American games together uh, at that sort of early um settler meeting yeah and i suppose a lot of audience then and probably now wouldn't have considered you know everyone whenever anyone thinks of um native americans or uh north american indigenous peoples everyone always thinks apaches sioux um you know those classic sort of cowboy and indian films Mm. whereas this is a film that's set in new york state or at, at the time new york the province it's one of the few films that gives um a look at the frontier before it really moved west, which I quite like. Yeah, they mentioned Algonquin at one point, didn't they? They do, yeah, yeah. It's not a completely historically correct sort of film. We can we can definitely say that much, 
but it's probably more correct than the original book was. So man basically walked a fine line between putting a little bit more historical accuracy, but also keep trying to keep the plot of the book. There's sort of some really massive disconnects between the book and the, and the film. Um, Production-wise, I suppose we should get back into the production um, before we move on. Uh, cinematography by uh, Dante Spinotti, who worked with Man on a lot of films, and he does brilliant work. The cinematography in this is really gorgeous. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And the locations are, are amazing. It's mostly shot in the Blue Ridge Mountains, which are, are in North Carolina rather than New York, but really stunning, really stunning location stuff. Can anyone guess who the military advisor on the film was? There's more than one. There is. But Dale Die from Private Ryan is yep. involved. Yep. Oh my gosh. Gets yep. everywhere. And, um, I the historical um consultant for the for the military aspects of it was Philip Haythornwaite. Ah. Who's a noted 18th century Napoleonic historian. Mm. But Dale Die was a surprise. I was like, really? So I know that it won Bef- uh, BAFTA for best cinematography. And it also picked up an Academy Award um, for Best Sound. Um, well, well deserved. Um, only man's only film that's won an Oscar, which is crazy. really that's yeah. amazing. The sound on it is great, though. The way they sell the gunshots, bullet strikes, and especially impacts from from knives, clubs. Yeah. You name it. Some of it is choreography and, and good filming and good editing, and some of it is the absolutely sickening noises that yeah. <laughs> the yeah. weapons make. When the gunstock club hits um, hits Magua's shoulder, there's those just wow, yeah, yeah. You can feel it, like blunt force trauma, isn't it? It's horrible. That reviewer uh, talking about how graphic it was, and she's surprised it got a twelve. I, actually, I don't disagree with the latter part, but uh, most of the violence is sold not by straight up gore. There's, there's a very gory shot of that spike protruding from Magua's back. Mm. Patient, it's like the, there's a guy yeah. who gets shot in the face at one point and you know he's clearly feeling the, the worst for it um, and that's done with <laughs> with some good makeup but a surprising amount of it is really quite quick cut and mm. your brain fills it in yeah you don't you don't see uh young get his throat slit for instance mm. or it's sort of just just out of frame it's where studio sells that scene he sells it because he gets a little spurt of blood on his face mm. and that's all you but- need there is the, I did forget the um, uh, compound fracture of his arm. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll definitely come back to this in fave scenes because I know we're going to be talking <laughs> about the, the promontory yeah. scene. And apparently the, the Fort William set cost six million, apparently. Wow. I can believe that. I can believe that. And the studio um, sent uh, um, um, like a, a studio head or studio exec to stand behind Michael Mann to stop him shooting too much. Because he was doing like 20 takes of a scene and they were worried the budget was spiraling and they'd send the guy and apparently he sat behind Michael Mann on takes and would just lean in and go, that's enough, Michael, move on. That might explain some of the editing, actually, because some of the editing around the action is a little rough. Mm, it gets mm. choppy, doesn't it, at certain points? Sometimes that adds to it a little bit, I think. Mm. In, oh, it um, does. You know, because it's kinetic in, in the way it's filmed and it adds a little bit, but... I know exactly what you mean. There are some some part, some transitions where it's like, hmm? and that's I think that's partially because the film when he took it to the studio it was three hours long. The original cut by nineties standards, that's very long, and it can drag a bit. It does drag a bit in places. What? Yeah. <laughs> Robbie Robbie is very critical of films that don't pace well. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get back to that one. <laughs> the score is gorgeous. Um, Ter- uh, Trevor Jones and Randy Eldman. Uh, worked on the score, so it was mostly Trevor Jones. Um, and because they were recutting everything, the, the musical cues had to change in some places, and, and Elbum came in and, and worked on that. And what I found really interesting was that it was originally going to be like a sort of electronic score, and then they reorchestrated it into a more traditional sort of orchestral thing, and little tinges of that sort of um, electronic score still in there at times, and you can you can basically hear what they were going to do, what going to, what they were going to be going for. Beautiful main theme, um, Promontory, um, which is based on a, a Dougie McLaren folk song called The Gale, um, which came out in the early 90s. Just one of my favourite parts of the film is is that, you know, the opening sequence where he's running through the, the brush and then obviously the promontory scene is, is spectacular with that score over the top. 
Mm. But yeah, I, I always thought the score was really great with this movie. And at one point, it's correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure it's played live within the movie as you know in in camp kind of thing i think it is in the back yeah in the background yeah i think you're right there the level of detail they went to in some of the sets is was quite interesting speaking of detail and you mentioned advisors and you know michael mann being certain a certain level a bit of a ridley scott in that he'll he'll pay a lot of attention to some details and then just kind of ignore others yeah but we we also have a relatively early example of a, a military boot camp. Well, not just military, but woodsman, mountain man, survivalist mm. boot camp that Day Lewis was put through for this. And so that was I had to write this down. A uh, Colonel David Webster, who essentially put him to get through a SEER school, uh, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape training. Wow! In, and had him weirdly. I found this fascinating from my perspective and Matt's. Trained him with M16, shotguns, pistols, position hold, moving through cover, that kind of thing, and then went backwards to the muzzle loaders. So he he came to it because one approach would have been to just launch him straight in, don't let him near a modern weapon. Yeah. But they got him into the mindset and then went back in time. I thought that was very interesting. Yeah, there's there's some um footage of that in the uh, the making of documentary isn't there that's where i saw and it. Yeah. he's there with an m16a1 i think it is and there's yep. um, he's got like a there's a sig pistol i think he, he he shoots on a range with and yeah there's a shotgun in there it's it's really interesting that they put him through that i think that's really i can't i i wonder i wonder if that was done on recommendation from people like dale die or it was just something man thought of or because i don't know when that came, became an industry practice it's, I mean, people always talk about Private Ryan with, with reference to that, and it mm. kind of snowballed from there. Yeah, they did it on a bridge too far as well, the APA. Um, right. Yeah, Attenborough's Private Army. Yeah. I'd be interested to know who, what, you know, the first recognizable movie actor boot camp when that was. Um, mm. This is relatively early, certainly for a for a, an individual sort of lead actor to be put through. Yeah. Mm. And, and you know, he, bul- he bulked up and he, lived somewhat he did a bit of a vigo mortensen and lived with the rifle mm. um, yeah and you can really see it he's just so he's so comfortable with that weapon and in that cloak in the costume and in that environment it really worked and that, that's you know they recognize the value of that now and they do it with virtually everybody i mean shame is that his accent wasn't on point as much because it's a bit over the shop in points it is a bit ropey um, <laughs> a little bit but- he sounded like I, he sounded like a new like he was from Newcastle in some bits to me. And I got really confused because he looks like Andy Carroll anyway, you know. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think we can let that excuse that as um, an old accent that you know from from the eighteenth century. That's maybe I wasn't think I wasn't thinking I wasn't thinking that. No, that that makes sense then. No, that makes sense. It's not what it is. That's not what he's doing. He's just doing a mid Atlantic accent. <laughs> Not that well. <laughs> no, it's, it's a bit ropey. There's some quips Modern. in there, aren't there? My my favourite is where he he stops him shooting at the running guy and says, "In case your aim is better than your judgment." <laughs> yeah, it's such a it's such an Arnie line, isn't it? You know, you, it's really it's Arnie. A bit, a bit too sophisticated for Arnie, I, I think. Yeah. But I like Hay- Haywood's reaction is totally British officer at the time. Just say, "What? What the hell did you <laughs> say to me?" Bam. <laughs> But but I like Hayward's um, the way he talks is quite accurate for me, and he, like he seems quite accurate. You know, I'll have you beaten from this fort. I I, I love that line. It's just such a you know, he, he really sells his character. It's a shame that he's not in more like roles like this because he's really good at them. Yeah, it he has that sort of interesting bit of um, period drama at the beginning where he's talking to um, Colonel Monroe's um, daughter and he's trying to ask for a hand in marriage, and he he very politely gets turned down. Yeah, um, and then later on, he gets less politely turned down. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although not as badly as she turns down uh, Magua. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 The ultimate snub, isn't it? I think Madeline Stowe in this is quite good. I think mm. she na- she nails that lad with a with the musket, but with the pistol, doesn't she? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 The headshot, the, cracking. The headshot. Yeah. Absolutely nails him. Yeah. Not even aiming properly, mind you. She's very close. Great point shooting. Yeah. Well, she's Mamro's daughter, so I assume she's picked it up from him. Yeah. (laughs) 
So should we move on to plot? So I've got down um, orphaned, adopted Hawkeye um, Poe falls in love with the British officer's daughter during the French Indian War of 1754 to 1763. That's literally the plot. There's there's nothing else going on, like cr- crazily. There's so much going on in this movie, but yet there's nothing going on as well. I, the plot re- is really weak for me this week because I'm just like, okay, so you fall in love with this girl and I totally get it. You know, she might be the, the most sophisticated, attractive woman you've ever seen. But you've how long have you been living there? And you had a family that you were, were talking to, and I assume that was your love interest. And and then you just abandon everything for this woman that you've met, like, in two seconds. But during this really amazing set-piece war film, it's just such a weird one. Yeah, I can understand where you're coming from with that. Um, it's a very... Um interesting plot in that it's very a to b to c in that mm. it's saves them takes them to the fort forts under siege fort falls they escape but don't escape but well enough not to be captured he goes into the um the village saves them but doesn't save them well enough <laughs> and then really great ending you know <laughs> it's almost like a road movie in that in that respect yeah, it's a it's a road movie through the Blue Ridge Mountains. <laughs> yeah, which is gorgeous, and that's you know that's not a bad thing. Well, I was watching film ninety two with Barry Norman, and he said that that matinee adventure fantasy. That's what he described it as. It is. It's James Fenimore Cooper who was. He, he, they were adventure novels, weren't they? Really, more than anything else. It is an adventure film, though. I think at heart, it just happens to be set in a war. It, it's such an interesting film. Um, but as a complete novice to the to the period, it was just nice to obviously know a bit a little bit about that that era. But it was nice to see it represented in film. It's very rare, to be honest. There's very few um, films that focus on the French and Indian Wars. Um, you've got um, Northwest Passage with Spencer Tracy, which is a great film from 1940. That's Rogers Rangers. Um, then you've got. Um, Drums Along the Mohawk, which was 39, with Henry Fonda. We've already mentioned um, Gary Cooper in uh, the, the earlier adaptation, but he was also in um, The Unconquered. And then there's uh, the Allegheny um, Uprising with John Wayne. Wow. All in this sort of tight, sort of mm. late 30s, 40s period. So it must have been one of those eras where American cinema going audiences were were interested in that sort of period, which I thought was really interesting. For me, for me the, the the plot, I think, I think what they tried to do, it, the book is clearly, I've never read it and I, and I never will. No, I haven't read it either. Everyone says it's terrible. Mm. Um, but, it, but it's iconic and has spawned all of these other adaptations. And so you're kind of saddled with this very limited plot. And what they've tried to do is recenter it on the native american place in the world or place in america and how that's that was under attack and so you can't always can't get away from a very lightweight plot and I, so i think they did more than the best of it i think they turned mm. it into some almost turned it into something different mm. and maybe the thing to do would have been to have made a, a different film but <laughs> i you know this thing is like a it's like a Rolling Stone that's gathered moss, hasn't it? For some people, it's the, the, yeah, the, it's a really the, great way of putting it. Yeah, iconic. So yeah, no, I quite, I quite like the way. So it doesn't really subvert um, the novel, but it does its own thing with it. Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, the novel's based loosely around the siege of Fort William Henry in 1757, which uh, it does say in the film. But obviously, this that siege was a little bit different in that the massacre that followed it that is depicted in the film wasn't quite as um, complete as it's portrayed in the film. Uh, only about 180 were killed. Right. Uh, and Monroe, obviously, he didn't actually die uh, during during that massacre. He died a few months later uh, okay. in, in Albany. Spoiler alert, guys. Come on. I know, exactly. Um, so there's, there's interesting sort of disconnects from... The history and from the book. I mean, as I was saying, it's sort of one of the few films which is made about the period, and it's definitely one of the few modern films that have been made about the period. Yeah, and it it does a fairly good job, I think, at sort of representing that conflict. Um, there's some 
little bit where I would disagree with um, what's portrayed, sort of like the the ambush scene at the beginning. Um, they've gone for, they've gone for portraying the the British as being very linear, which by the uh, by 1757 they'd definitely learnt their lessons from Braddock's massacre, essentially yeah. when he was retreating from uh, Monongahela. By the middle of that war, they they taken on that what was then known as the Indian way of war, and they taken on sort of the light infantry, use cover, move. Definitely don't all stand shoulder to shoulder. Yeah, you not in space column. out a bit. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So I guess in movie terms, that's what people think of. Yeah. When you think of that war, you're probably not thinking French Indian War. You're probably thinking Napoleonic War, and that's your sort of mm. pin for that period. You know, you see muskets, you think you think Napoleonic. Yeah, mm. you, see, you see muskets and tricorn hats, you think Napoleonic era. Whether you're right or wrong, so to have guys in column, in lot firing in line is just what people expect, I guess, when muskets are brought in. And maybe for an American audience, it's the the War of Independence that is in mm-hmm. their head. So they're thinking it, it in that sense. Yeah. You know, maybe they're just yeah. turning up to see English troops get killed because they don't like redcoats. It's sort of... <laughs> well, they also forget that in the American War of Independence, most of the casualties were inflicted by either side in linear warfare, not in hiding behind trees being... Mm-hmm because that's you know you generally met on the field and and had a battle had it out yeah and the movie teases it and it really annoys me it teased it i got really annoyed at that bit you know like the light infantry stuff that matt's talking about we, we could do that by then we knew how to do that by then and we were we were fighting on those terms where where appropriate daniel day lewis um poe he even mentions like you have to get away from their skirmishes when they're trying to escape the fort later on in the movies like there's an outpost here and then he mentioned to skirmishers, so I'm like, well, hang on a minute. Then someone who's written this does have a knowledge, yeah, of that. Era. Although he probably means pickets, but yeah, yeah. But I assumed it was people with like, you know, it was just troops on acting on their own initiative. That's a great scene, which I think we'll talk about in in fave scenes. But yeah. so I think we should move on to Ali Tally because the, the the plot this week isn't it's not the strongest, but there's a lot going on, and then mm-hmm. we'll get into it. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, Jonathan, as our guest this week, we'd love to hear your Ali first. I've got a bit of a two-tier one, because I think the, the star of the show for, for me has to be The Rifle. Mm. I, I believe is called Kill Deer, um, but I don't think that's ever said on camera. I don't think so, but that's it interesting. Gripped. It's certainly what it was dubbed between either between Michael Mann and the guy that made it, mm. uh, who was a chap called Wayne Watson. There's a whole story here that we haven't got time to go into, where another rifle maker, because of course there are there have been almost continuously guys who have the skill to make lock, stock, and barrel and build it into a rifle with the same skill as someone from 200, 300 years ago. Mm. And so they sought out a guy to do that. And the two rifles he provided that were authentic to period, Michael Mann didn't, well, he liked them. In fact, he kept them apparently, but he did not use them. And he went out to this Wayne Watson chap to create something that was actually a Pennsylvania rifle of about 1820. And that's what Killdeer is. Um, Right. But having, having, so it's 50, 60 years out of, out of date and visibly so if you know your long rifle mm-hmm. or you know 18th century rifles but it's so it's so beautifully made and so well handled and so prominent it's an extension of the character it's about as alley as an 18th century or early 19th century <laughs> design can get so so that's my vote and then there's a particular scene involving it i don't i can save that for later or we can talk about it now go for it yeah I actually had an inquiry about this, believe it or not, from a member of the public at the museum. And I realised that I knew what he was talking about, but I hadn't ever looked into it. And so I did. <laughs> and this is the the fort scene, the courier scene that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So he, he's preparing actually multiple rifles. And this is where the editing doesn't quite flow. Mm-hmm. They, they've cut it up and put stuff a bit out of order, I think. Um so he's, they're preparing different weapons. There's more, more than one of them. <clears throat> and the idea is to cover this guy as he gets away from the fort. Brilliant scene. 
And <clears throat> like all the other scenes involving um, the rifles in particular, you really get the sense of the skill, experience, and the effort required to accurately fire a shot with a with a weapon. It's very hard to depict that. He does it in heat with the FNC. Yes. Just that moment of quiet and still and bam. And you get that in this. Yeah. Um, and so the bit I'm blithering toward is um, he gets a length of silk and he's kind of quietly cutting this piece of silk clothing in the prior scene, actually. And you don't, you don't really notice what he's doing. Yeah, he says, do you mind? And he takes off a shelf, doesn't he? Yeah. Oh, is that what that is for? Okay. Yeah. I thought he was a bit... I thought it was a bit of bandage. Like I thought he'd nicked himself on the way in or something. Ah, oh, okay. That's exactly what it looks like in the scene. But then you realise later, or if you, if you care enough, you go back and look, and he has it on his kit. And then what he's doing, and this should really have happened in a different sequence, but he actually, with his knife, cuts a, a patch of silk, and then he would have loaded the bullet on top of that, with obviously pour the powder in first, and the idea, and he actually says another 40 yards i think is the line yeah that's it yeah which is as presented nonsense mm-hmm. you know you, you can't get another 40 yards by adding a silk patch unless unless the idea was you were just patching the the gap because it creates a uh it, it reduces what's called the windage so the gap around the bullet yeah. and prevents some of the gases being wasted as they go past but so that's true of any patch so rif- riflemen would use patches silk or no silk or no exactly yeah now the kind of the argument presented if you like is that it's silk and is a tight weave a little more loosely woven piece of cloth might be less efficient but there's no way you're getting an extra 40 yards out of it uh, out of just that but having gone back to the script <laughs> originally it was just a tightly woven cloth and he wets it so it's and there's something called spit patching that right. is done today and was almost certainly done then. Yeah. But the critical thing is that it, they do specify a stouter charge of powder as well. Okay. So he's getting his extra 40 yards from more gunpowder. <laughs> right. Plus a little bit more and maybe a little bit more precision from his wet, tight wo- weaven, weaven? tight woven patch. That's so interesting because, wow. I mean, as you mentioned there, the editing is a little bit off because it kind of goes straight to the frizzen. After he's cut it, it doesn't show him put it in the ball and seat in the ball and, and ramming it down. It, the, it sort of, the camera cuts to a close-up of the lock. It's weirder than that, actually. It shows, it? having just watched it again, I paid particular attention to this scene again, and I'm pretty sure it's the same rifle as, he, as in his rifle. Mm. And he, he he's shown ramming. Then it cuts to him cutting the yeah, cell. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Which is the wrong way around. Mm. It's, the, it's too late now. Yeah. Uh, then it cuts to him tapping priming powder into the pan. So it's in completely the wrong order, unless it's a quick, it's like a, a montage of him loading different weapons. But I don't think it is. I think it's just an editing goof. I think it is too. Because it can now yeah. you say it, I got really confused in that scene because he was getting handed so many rifles that I, I, it was lost on me that he'd put. Even and is it, it is it is it the the long rifle that he fires last at that last yeah. shot? Okay, good. Well, we got that right at least. Yeah, because I assume he <laughs> fired it first, and then he by the time that he'd fired all those others, his was ready to shoot again. Surely they'd have to show one of his Ooh. mates putting the silk in. Yeah, because he didn't load. Yeah. I think the other two are, are muskets. Right. Uh, do you know, I'm not even sure. I th- I'd have to go back again. And <laughs> um, My impression is that they might be rifles as well. Mm. I mean, th- they could, in fact, be fouling pieces. They could, yeah. They yeah. were often, often used. In fact, I only learned recently, were used in the English Civil War as well as a sort of sharpshooter's weapon. Right. And you can, you can get up to 100 yards. You can be as good as a a military rifle with one of those because the muskets are lasers in this movie like one thing that i did sort of notice it's got that trope of extremely accurate musketry in certain sequences the ranges aren't too bad though yeah it, it, yeah i was gonna say is that me sort of thinking something from history and then putting it into a movie and I'm like, is that just a cliche's wrong there partly partly that maybe but um 
I'm trying to think. I'm struggling to think of a scene where musketry is shown to be. Very oh, see, ah, you see, so this is me getting my muskets and my rifles mixed up because I don't know I enough about so. the period. Yeah, this is this is the episode that ruins for the Fox <laughs> podcast. I'm just <laughs> getting two firearms experts and someone who's <laughs> read Saul David's All the King's Men, and it just goes all to part. So, <laughs> I know, I know what you're saying, Rob. So you're what you're thinking of is the musketry from the linear formations, the the, the red coats isn't yeah. particularly accurate because they're basically in every scene they're seen in, they're seen blasting foliage. That's what their main task seems to be. And then there's there's um Hawkeye and the guys that are firing the I think they're mostly r- rifles. Then there might be one or two that are okay um sort of trade muskets, fowlers type, but they're very accurate. Yeah, but okay. I think that's because they're patching. And the ranges that they're shooting at aren't super long. Yeah, there aren't. Yeah, actually, no, there aren't many. There aren't many long range shots attempted. It's the, it's just that one shot when he's the courier, isn't it? And he nails the guy. Yeah, and it puts it puts that yeah. sort of nice emphasis on it, where it, it slows everything down. There's the music gets a little bit quieter, and we get that panning shot along the length of the barrel up to, you know, you know, the lock and his trigger finger, and that's it. That's the heat shot, isn't it? Yeah, it's the heat shot. It's mm. it's the 18th century heat shot. And the the uh, the picket, the guy that was chasing the courier, just gets knocked down. And mm. he even has a squib because a little little patch oh, of red yeah. appears on yep. his chest, which I thought was a neat. I've learned the difference between muskets and rifles today, even though I should have known it anyway. Jonathan, do you want to explain the difference between a musket and a rifle? Yeah, as you're the as you're the ranking firearms expert here. <laughs> <laughs> that, Don't put yourself okay. down, Matt. God. Yeah. <laughs> Next um, week, me and me and uh, I haven't got the title uh, keeper yeah. of firearms and artillery. So yeah. you heard it here, folks. From next week, it's just me and Jonathan because Matt's <laughs> Matt's just you know. I don't think that, Jonathan has the time. But if you want to, yeah. off your wall, Matt. Take that degree down. You've just <laughs> you've ruined your whole professional lineage here. <laughs> uh, difference between a rifle and a musket. Yeah. Um, Right, so actually, people don't realise this, but rifle is technically short for rifle gun, um, unless it's short for rifle musket. Because <laughs> uh, a gun is, well, everyone knows what a gun is. Um, if you if you put a spiral groove in the barrel, um, originally termed screwing, so a screwed gun, um, that gives you accuracy because it spin stabilises the bullet. So very early, you know, originally it would have been called a, a screwed a screwed gun or a screwed birding piece or fowling piece or whatever the thing might be. You can see why they, they went with rifle. <laughs> yes. It's a shame, really. Uh, yeah, the opportunity is is, is lost now. But uh, yeah, so that <laughs> sometime about the 1680s that they start using the term rifled, which is from, you know, like you rifle through a drawer, you, you rifle a palace of its of its loot. Yeah. Um, rifle the barrel uh so you're pulling out material when you're rifling yeah Mm -hmm. the main thing is the is the um, rifled bore which you can't see from the outside of Mm. course and so in the movie you can spot the rifles because they're shorter they have a a dropped curved stock if you think of something like a winchester later on that still has a hint of that dropped down stock which is which positions your eye behind the sights which for a musket is not really at all important. Yeah. Um, so in this context, they're they're shorter. They've got sights. They've got a dropped butt stock. And what, as Matt says, though, some of them look like they could be something a bit different. And a fouling piece, you don't really know whether that's a rifle or not without getting up close and personal with it. So there you go. Basically, a, a musket is a smooth bore, uh, a barrel that isn't rifled, hence is less accurate. Um, because there's no spin imparted on the ball. I must um, bore you briefly further with musket is technically just a military long gun, mm-hmm. which is why you have the, f- the phrase rifle musket. Okay. Uh, yes. So very, yeah. very quickly that falls away because all muskets are rifles and it's just more convenient to call them all rifles, if that makes sense. Right. So for a period of time, we have rifle muskets because we used to have, yeah, musket is, this is why we still have the term musketry later because it's the application of military fire, military infantry, long gun fire, and it doesn't matter whether it's rifled or not, technically. Mm-hmm. This is great. This is why I love doing this, because I'm like, I just watched the movie, but now I'm learning all about it. This is fantastic. Great. Whether you want it or not. Proper terminology and 
now we all, everyone knows what the difference between uh, a smoothbore, a musket, and a rifle is. There we go. You don't get that on other film pods. You definitely bloody don't get that on other film pods. So, Matt, your rally this week. Okay, this is a bit contentious because it's, it doesn't appear in every cut of the film. During the siege sequence, that part where the, Jonathan's just mentioned, where the courier uh, tries to break off and get to um, Fort Edward, I think it is, Monroe says that Major Hayward will uh, provide a, a diversion, a distraction. And in the version that's on Netflix and the version that's often shown on TV, a lot has been cut and spliced and changed. In the version I had as a kid, which was on, on VHS, um, or maybe DVD, I don't remember, but I vividly remember um, the, the diversion being briefly shown. So it's like a, it's a, it's a very short shot of Hayward with a line of grenadiers and one of the grenadiers behind him is armed with a flintlock hand mortar, which is essentially a um, an 18th century grenade launcher. Everyone often forgets that grenades have been around a lot longer than the, the 19th, 20th century. Yeah. And they date back into the, the 1500s, probably even earlier. And they're often made from either iron or, or little bits of pot. By this point, they're predominantly iron and the fragmentation weapon. So you light a little fuse, you pop it in the, the very short barrel of your hand mortar, and then your hand mortar is a flintlock, much like the, the muskets and fouling pieces and, and rifles shown in the film. And then you fire that, and then it projects it downrange, hopefully landing amongst your 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 enemies and, and doing yeah. all kinds of chaos and damage. But it's, this, it's so briefly seen in the director's cut of the movie but it's just too cool not to mention because I can't think of any any other film where it appears. If you don't know what it is, you're just sat there thinking, why is that man holding a very stubby gun? I mean, I'd never I'd never even seen one until Matt sent me a photo. And then obviously you scour the film and on function of the Netflix version doesn't have it on there, but... Not just including it, but making it. Oh, yeah. Mm. It's probably been adapted from a, an existing prop musket, but the actual mm. um, muzzle section has been fabricated Often made of brass, weren't they the original ones? And yeah, we've we've got quite a few different flavors of this. Uh, we've even got one with where the cup launcher, if you like, is built into the butt stock. Oh right. Now my my impression from I haven't really researched this in any depth, and if you've come across references, Matt, let me know. My impression is that virtually all of these, whether they're little stubby launchers like the one that you can see on IMFDB, if you, if you go on there, if you can't see it on Netflix, yeah, sadly. Or the thing I've just described, the standard version seems to have been a naval thing. Mm. Not heard tell of them being used for land service. I I haven't looked it in too much depth, but from when I did my um, my undergraduate dissertation, well, it was about light infantry tactics, mostly in North America, mm -hmm. and in that came about you know the, the other the other end of the flank companies is the Grenadiers. By that point, by the 1770s, then there's nothing like that anymore. They're not even carrying grenades at that point. The the French and Indian War, the Seven Years War, I've never seen an actual account of a grenade being used um, from a from a launcher in North America, and I don't even know um, how widely they you know they were they were used prior, so you know seventeen forties etc. But yeah, I, I I've never seen um, in depth research on them, so I, it was just a really interesting thing that I, I saw in in the film. I remember that it was was in the film and. Thankfully, someone did capture it and put it online. Yeah. So it confirmed it for me. And at the very least, it's plausible because mm. we've got at least one that we date to about 1740. And it's it looks very much like the one in the movie. It's, it's just a bit shorter, actually. So for me this week, I mean, I've, got, I've got two. I've got a question to ask John and I've got my own alley pick. So I'm a, I'll go with my own alley pick. It's the Gunstock War Club that we see awesome. um, that, that Matt Maguire gets taken out with at the end of the movie. It's just an amazing looking bit of kit. You know, I've never seen one before. Yeah, it just look, it looks like a, a gun stock. It looks like sort of, I mean, to me, it looked like a matchlock sort of type stock in a way. It's got that really sort of angled design. And I can sort of see why you'd make it like that because it's, it's a really good sort of ergonomic design for swinging and hitting people with. And it's got little tomahawks on it. And it's just, and it's seen a lot from a lot of contemporary things that I found is, is that there's a, a, like a, a drawing from Fort William siege of the French troops trying to stop the 
that they're Native American allies attacking the the British column. Mm. And there's a guy swinging one in that sketch. As we say with the cinematography, they're taking cues from paintings. I wonder if the reason it's included in the movie is because there's sketches from the time of showing them in use. Yeah, yeah. But I just, it's a great inclusion. I mean, it's, I don't, I've don't, i never seen one in any movie before. It's just a really, really interesting little inclusion. And even though it is really cool, it gets used really sparingly, but in a good way. Yeah, you get that first spear bit during the, the first ambush when he throws it and that's like, wow, okay. Mm, mm. It likes like... Um, so good it's, isn't it but it's a very cool weapon and i think it's such an interesting thing where again the uh, european influence on native culture comes in where they've been inspired by the shape of a gun stock to make a, a melee weapon mm. from that shape i just think that's re- I, I haven't looked into it but th- watching the film again i was like i need to look into that and see if anyone's written anything interesting about it because I want to know more about what that is and why they did that there's so much to go on tangents from this movie I think that's one of the strengths of it my question for John is I was reading up some um, weapons that were used in the film and then there was you know the different rifles and now muskets I'm glad we cleared that up earlier but I came across trade muskets and I'd never heard of like what what they were before trade muskets I mean where do they come from the IMFDB thing is a bit curious and they're very confident that these are trade muskets and I suppose they probably are as we've established it's quite hard to tell you know some of these things might be fouling pieces not so much muskets so there's there's, there's a i suppose there's a spectrum um if you think of modern rifles you know ar-15s can be both military rifles or civilian rifles and sometimes the visual difference is very little and the same is kind of true here so a trade musket is simply a musket that's been traded (laughs) okay fair enough so, so that means they they might look exactly like a brown vest, right? And the only difference would be the markings. You know, it wouldn't have a uh, tower, George or whichever the monarch is at the time monogram cipher on the lock, and the various little broad arrow uh, ownership acceptance marks and the military proof marks. They'd have civilian proof marks or no proof marks. A lot of trade muskets certainly later on didn't see proof, mm-hmm. and so might blow up because <laughs> that's really what they are cheap. Poundland versions Love it. of a musket or maybe they're more like a fowler but typically they have the look of a musket because that's well, that's what they wanted like a famous design that everyone knows the look of sort of thing yeah looks like a brown bass looks like a charleville same thing when you go on wish.com and you buy something that looks like something else and it's not as good <laughs> i just find it really interesting it's just it's nice the movie takes the time to sort of showcase all these different weapons and doesn't just stick with the, the the old classics, you know, yeah. sort of like in cowboy movies, everyone's got a certain type of revolver, things like that. At least this what this film does go out of its way to present some really interesting firearms. There's a really good variety, actually. Mm. Um, but yeah, some, some of them, yeah, you call them, call them trade muskets. They might be, they might have been locally made. Yeah, it makes know. sense for the militia because they, they, you know, they bang on about protecting their homes and they've all got weapons. So it makes perfect sense. But I just thought it was a really interesting little thing. It's a cost thing as well. So if you think about it in in the reality of, of, of the period, so if you if you can't afford a handmade fouling piece, then you might get a trade a trade gun. Yep. Um it's the same now with with Jonathan mentioned AR-15s. You can get mil spec AR-15s, and then you can get AR-15s that aren't mil spec. And mil spec has come to be this sort of uh, standard that you look for because it's what the military spec is that makes sense so that ali telly this week was absolutely fascinating i learned so much i think we'll move on to favorite scenes yeah john what's your favorite scene from the film as guest you you have to go first it's the law i've I've kind of cheated in in that I combined the alley bit of kit with one of my favourite scenes. But then I suppose because I'm a bit critical of it, it can't be my my true favourite. And my true favourite is, and there's all sorts of analogies you could think of, but it's like the 18th century version of the Matrix lobby scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it is the run, the promontory, the running up the mountainside, take, you know, smoking fools <laughs> left, right and centre, yeah. uh, melee combat, uh, New York reloads, 
a dual reel, a dual dual wield with two yeah. rifles yeah. at one point, which, which is not entirely plausible in that he's hit firing and not even looking, and he takes out two guys who must be set, you know, a number of feet apart. This is but what, hey, this is Hawkeye. Hawkeye. Don't forget, yeah, <laughs> it's Hawkeye. So we we let him off. But it's kind of got it all, and the the the, the build so build of the music, the the way it's filmed. Um, there's no no issues, I don't think, with the editing there. No. Except what I have one complaint, and that's that in the behind the scenes they talk about tra- one of the many things Daniel Day Lewis trained to do was to reload on the run. Wow! And you see him do that very briefly, but you don't see him complete it. In fact, it's you really only see a hint of him mm. starting to do it, mm. and then it cuts. And to try and keep that Michael Mann fast-paced feel, we lose what could have been a really amazing sort of yeah. feat. Really, I wonder, I wonder if Daniel Day Lewis can still do that. That'd be amazing if he can. Maybe, maybe he never quite nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've dropped my powder. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I think that scene, that whole scene, the choreography of it is amazing. And yeah, in the behind-the-scenes really cool. stuff, which is up on YouTube. Um, you do see him practicing some of those uh, moves that he does, you know, in the, in the, the central ambush, the, the massacre scene, there's that great scene where he, he cuts like someone's um, tendons behind their knee. Oh yeah. That's, Oof. that's horrible. That's a hell of a scene. Um, and he, you see him practicing that a couple of times and you see him actually doing the reload practice. There's a little clip of it. It doesn't, it, again, mm. it doesn't show you the whole thing. Mm. There's a lot, a lot of running in this movie. There is a lot of running, yeah. and it culminates in the ultimate scene of running, where, as I say, it's like, or you could compare it to the Circle Club in the first John Wick movie, <laughs> where it's just a highly skilled guy moving from A to B, wasting people, and it's amazing. He does go a bit de- like Rambo, doesn't he? A little bit, and he goes a bit one one man army. But there's a one bit, and I'm, I'm sticking in my craw, and I have to say it in that sequence where Daniel Day's just knocked out half that column of lads and he they go for a little cave clearing to get to where M- mogwai is trying to kill U- U- unax and daniel day lewis brushes up against the side of a rock and it's not a rock it's like a piece of like cloth or like rubber like tarpaulin or something and it just judders <laughs> there's a separate scene ruin the someone... whole film for you hasn't it but there's a separate scene where someone's running past it and it clearly is like a bit of rock, just a bit of like fake rock pulled over a frame or something. Can I can I just say, I know Matt said before we went live that he he knew that and, and was looking for it and didn't see it. I didn't know that and so didn't look for it, but I just Googled it and the top result is a YouTube video, 18 seconds long, called hilariously last fake rock of the Mohicans. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic i love it there's supposed to be a chain link fence at the beginning of the film you know where he begins that the deer hunt there's supposed to be just in in the corner of the shot there's a chain link fence and then as they're marching out from the surrender of the fort apparently there's a couple of propane tanks visible at one point it's not as bad as the je- the guy wearing jeans in the uh, gladiator though is it i mean <laughs> yeah. So. yeah it's just a nice, it's just a great little gaff yeah it is but that whole scene yeah it's fantastic is just, isn't it? It, it still gives me goosebumps mm. That and the and the um the ambush at the beginning, which I think Rob's going to talk about in, in a second. Yeah, they both. Yeah, you know, every time I watch them, I'm like, damn, this this mm-hmm. is so well done. One thing that I did think about watching that is there's a bit where he sort of like hits a guy in the face with his rifle. I've always been struck by long rifles always seem quite fragile, so I always think they're always gonna gonna break this, you know, because the stocks are so thin on them. There's a lot of hand to hand in that film where you think. No, I think that's legitimate. If you, especially the night, the more nicely made ones, the more wood you remove to make them look nice, the more chance of it breaking. Yeah. Um, but this is why things like brown bess are big and clunky. Uh, it's the, the the brown bess is the AK of the 18th and 19th century. It is, yeah. and I can't, I can't, I can't let this podcast go without asking Jonathan to briefly try and explain to us where the name Brown Best comes from, because he wrote a paper on this and it's very good. Surprisingly straightforward. You know, people can write thousands of words about it, apparently, but it's actually really straightforward. <laughs> there have been lots of attempts to explain it, a bit like, you know, the hence the expression thing of 
Mm. It was named after Queen Elizabeth, hence Beth. Yeah, which... Mm. Yeah, and the, named after its brown barrel. Well, the barrels weren't brown. There's some of them even more ridiculous than that. I can't bring them to mind at the moment, but it's actually really straightforward. It's the fact that the stock is brown, okay. but also the dual meaning of the word brown, which originally meant ordinary, and Bess being a sort of generic nickname for a woman, a sort of ordinary woman, a common woman, mm-hmm. camp follower, a prostitute maybe. Yeah, yeah. Who might be also tanned from the sun. So potentially the gun's brown, the woman's a bit brown, um, and she's brown in the sense of being ordinary. Bess. That makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. And it's almost definitively that. I mean, often it's very hard to be definitive about these things, but we have enough sources going far enough back to be pretty damn sure that that's what this means. Yeah, that's fascinating. That's this, this is the only only movie podcast you will ever hear someone explain what a brown Bess is to you. Now, this is a great Guaranteed. episode this week. People are getting, you know, people are getting, you know, taught about musketry and rifles and this is why we love doing it because we love to do the movie but we also get all these extra great little bits of history on top and it's exactly why we do it definitely so, rabbit holes yeah exactly and you know you, you'd be silly not to go down them so what's yours rob what's your favorite scene as i say at the start i had only seen it a couple of times for the, for the podcast um when I'm, I'm choosing the ambush at the start because i wasn't expecting it and it really came out of the blue because you know i'll get into it later i think the pacing at times could do with a little bit of a trim and I already know they've trimmed. That's it. what the studio said as well. Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm that bloke, but I'm Michael Mann. You know, I'm him. But I was thinking, oh come on, I'm begging for something to happen at this point. You know, nearly half an hour in. So Magwai is, is attached as a scout to Haywood's um, column that are going to reinforce Fort William Henry. So uh, Cora um, complains about being tired, and, and they say, can we stop to Haywood? And he's like, yes, you know, scout, we're going to stop here. Um, um, and Maguire goes, no, no, you know, up here is much better um, to, you know, rest. It's like a, a clearing. It's much nicer. So, OK, like nothing to untoward there. You know, Haywood's clearly a little bit annoyed, um, but they keep going up the, 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 the little passageway through the through the woods. And then Maguire sort of walks back towards the end of the column. And you're thinking, OK, nothing wrong there. He's just going to check check behind the column to see if anything's going on. You know, at this point, he's not the movie's antagonist. He's just a new character. And then he drops a little tomahawk by the side of his like thigh. And I'm like, oh, hang on. Okay. And then you get the really sh- sort of low sound, sort of the soundtrack start to kick in a little bit. And you think, okay, something's coming. And he absolutely wallops this poor red coat in the neck. He's so shocked, isn't he? Poor yeah, lad. that poor little lad. He literally, I think he's only like, he mustn't be at nearly 20 or something. It's really young. Maguire lets rip with a, 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 a like a, a musket from his waist hip fires it and then see, this is where the editing annoyed me because i'm thinking well maguire's toast there's like 20 red coats around him you're gonna batter him to death with their brown besses but he vanishes so i assume he ran up into the into the ridge line or something and then all hell breaks loose and, and maguire's mates come out of the, you know, the, the the tree line and start absolutely caning this little little company of red coats that get they just get routed don't they really quickly I assumed Haywood was green. I assumed he didn't know what he was doing. And he's trying to protect the two women. And I'm like, well, you're going to be toast as well, mate, in a minute. And then, oh, no, Hawkeye comes and saves the day. Hooray. It's just a great little scene. And all the, especially when Daniel Day comes in, because he starts co- really choreograph fighting these people. Um, and the Rachel Coates didn't try choreograph fighting, that they just got killed. And they should have tried <laughs> choreograph fighting off the, the their assailants. If only they tried some choreography, god yeah, damn it. Yeah, the, the British <laughs> Army should have been training that, really. Um, take the King Shilling and some choreographed fighting exercises, please. And it sets the tone for every other set piece after, because the set pieces ramp, and then they ramp again, and you get that battle at the end. But it, as an as a opening set piece to any film, it's, it's a great one. Yeah, for sure. You just made me realise something that is kind of missing from the movie, but I think you can kind of explain it. Very little bayonet action. Some of them end up with them on, but you don't see them use them, yeah, really. Because Haywood, Haywood just calls them to make ready and fire mm. in that sequence. He doesn't say fix bayonets, which is the first thing you'd do. There's always lads sort of readying their brown bases as clubs. Shouldn't you, Is there not an order for that? Because they seem to do it quite quick, some of them. There's, the, the, there's a lot to say in this sequence, which cinematically is brilliant, and I love it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, I, I love the bit where, you know, the score's pounding and Daniel Day-Lewis and the lads just come charging through. That's great. 
um, and they just start ripping who on apart because that's not fun. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> away um, lads. Exactly. Yeah. Daniel Day Lewis definitely showed away the lads before they away came the in. Lads. Um, <laughs> and I like I like your theory, Rob, that Hayward is green. He's fresh off the boat. He's just arrived from England. It's interesting because they are fighting as they would have fought um, before any of the experience of fighting in North America. So those lads are supposed to be the 60th Royal American Regiment, um, which were later, much later, a uh, light infantry regiment. But at this point, they're a line regiment. Well, at that, this point in the war, they're fairly experienced in how to fight. That ambush is an allusion to Braddock's um, defeat at Monongahela, where um, they did fight in linear formations in close quarters. And an interesting thing that the film doesn't portray, it, it doesn't show the Indians firing from the tree line. Instead, the natives come in and it's hand-to-hand melee quite quickly after the first volley. Whereas at uh, Monongahela, they they picked off the densely packed infantry over a course of hours. And you can't you can't advance linear infantry into a tree line because it'll just break up and then all of the training that they've done for years previously evaporates and it wasn't until fighting in north america became um, a serious prospect that was faced by larger numbers of the british army because previously they had been mostly like a colonial settler type mm. militia yep. that had fought a lot of the smaller wars with the french and, and with the the uh, native inhabitants at this point there's a lot of uh, british soldiers in north america and they're having to learn how to fight in this completely different quite confined sort of landscape where it's mm. trees there's uh, brush there's foliage lots of cover and they're fighting an enemy that is totally skilled in light infantry warfare and you know they're they've honed these skills from fighting each other and through hunting if that's true, and it prob- I think it probably is now that we've dissected it a little bit, but if you're a red coat, fresh off the boat, mm-hmm. and, you, and so you're not fighting another line, you're fighting someone who's running at you mm-hmm. with got you don't know what weapons they've got, you don't know what their fighting style is going to be like. You, you know they're not even wearing like a regimental un- a regimented uniform. That's really got to shit you up in that split second. You're not going to know what to do. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a psychological aspect to it, most definitely, because you're fighting an enemy which is, you know, everyone's told you are savages. At that point, what would have probably been more likely is they would have opened ranks and moved forward. Yeah, and to the, meet yeah, them with bayonet. The fire control would have been better. But it's a great scene. I really like it. And there's interesting little historical caveats you can you can take from it. Oh yeah, you told me he's got a saber when he shouldn't have a saber. Oh yeah, Hayward has a saber where he would have probably had a spadroon. So Matt, favorite favorite scene? Um, my favorite scene, I think, is I mean, I, I love the ambush in the center of the film, but I really love the siege. And it's probably one of the few films to bother uh, representing or that would need to represent because there's not that many films about the period, like we said earlier. But it's one of the few films that portray an 18th century siege to the point where you have large siege guns. They talk about digging saps forward, um, counter fire, counter battery fire. And then they do quite a detailed little shot of them loading mortars. Yeah. Which is again, very rare in films. And they, they do quite, a, a, the mortars are very OP. They're very overpowered in this. So like, as soon as the mortars are there, then that's it. It's game over. Yeah. Which is, which is true. That is, um something that did was true of sieges of the period um but they do they do lay waste pretty quickly and that's that's more or less one of the things i like about that film is that it, they spent that six million and, and showed that scale so there's loads yeah. of extras running around carrying ordnance mm. mentioned it earlier there's lots of uh guys uh running around inside the fort itself and it even shows them aiming at one of the saps there's a sequence where they aim at one of the saps where the guys are digging the trench forward to get the mortars in position and that's where the movie changes though the movie goes from adventure film that could be a frontier sort of movie but it it doesn't do that it just switch flips on its head and it just becomes like oh it's a siege movie now and you get that beautiful sweeping shot of all the french 
troops coming up and then you've got you know hawkeye and and the main cast in the canoe coming up the in coming up the river so you're see they're seeing it from a completely different angle so you get to see it from a different angle everything is thought of and as as we say the cinematography is really good but that the sense of scale there is just it's off the charts yeah the bit where they come out of the woods and they see the flashes in the distance yeah really nice that's really that's really something it's mm. it's a very well done sort of sequence and probably six million dollars well spent i would say definitely but, and yeah. i've got to give an honorable mention for the battle the last battle when the column are attacked the way that the musket fire rifle fire will the puffs of smoke come out of the tree line and mm. the column realize that they're under attack and it just it goes from like one or two little cracks to a crescendo of volley. Yep. And it, it just sounds so good. And you get that lovely shot of the whole column. Yeah. And you see like the independent companies, they're more like platoon size, but they're supposed to be companies sort of returning fire. Mm. And you've got lads, you know, lads panicking in the middle, holding their brown besses ready like to hit people with. No CGI to to do this in post this all has yeah. to be choreographed only so many takes to be able to pull that off oh there is one awful bit of cgi though did you see the bit with the waterfall the waterfall is that cgi it looks really weird it looks like know. it's like like a paint like a bad blue screen i'm pretty sure i know what that is and it's because there's a similar waterfall scene in predator uh -huh. where it suddenly goes to a, a totally different film stock it might even be stock footage film for something else or um, a reshoot or something. I think that's what it God is. Damn, Michael Mann ran out of money to shoot a waterfall. <laughs> he spent six million on Fort Henry. <laughs> we ain't got no money left. Uh, I, I do love your, your 1930s <laughs> film exec voice. It's that, just... It's anytime best. it's an executive decision, yeah. the 30s film man comes out. <laughs> he, he's better than Daniel Day-Lewis's American <laughs> actor. <laughs> <laughs> that that three years doing that drama degree was well spent. Um. It was, it was. Um, yeah, that that scene is great because you get all of those. There's that, there must be at least three hundred people in that scene plus. Yes, yeah. yeah, incredible. Um, and it, the choreographing of of getting them all to begin firing at the right time, it must mm. must have been mind blowing, like you say, Jonathan. And what what I always liked about that is that you see you see the two um, daughters sort of like ride off into the into the towards the indians and then get off their horse which is exactly what i would not have ever have done i would have continued to ride my horse away <laughs> they have to do but, that so daniel day lewis can come in and stake his claim oh it's true the love it's interest true. yeah because mm -hmm. the only reason a lot of people do the certain things in this movie that they do is because it has to drive the plot and there's certain points where especially that battle scene it's not really it's not really the plot anymore. It's just a really nice battle sequence. Yeah. And they have to sort of ground it somewhere. One of the parts I do like about that, that Maurice Robes is on horseback, Kale Monroe, and a Huron jumps on the back of his horse and tries to stab him. And he blocks the hatchet with his sword, takes a horse pistol oh. and shoots him around his body. <laughs> That's so... <laughs> It's so it's so cool. It's yeah. a very it's a very hardcore moment, and it just goes to show that Kel Monroe knew what he was doing because he's he is there. He's like he's he's sabering these these uh, attacking uh, Huron. We can't not discuss the fact that Magua shoots his horse from under him. Yes, and uh, then comes and carves his heart out. Oh yeah, and very that metal. is cool. That that is that. I remember watching that as a kid, going, "Oh my god!" Yeah, and, and just being, say, like... just being totally shocked. Was it something that I, you know, I'll make sure that I kill your daughters mm. or your offspring so there's no seed left, seedling yeah. left or something? I'm like, Jesus Christ, you really hate this bloke, don't you? I so like, in the film, Magua's entire sort of motivation is that he doesn't like what the English, the British are doing uh, to his people. Yeah. Which is fair point. And I and completely a, sided with him. But what is interesting is that in the book, the reason he hates Monroe is because he got him addicted to fire water. Oh. Yes. Oh. So he got, apparently in the book, he hates Monroe because he got him individually addicted to, to gambling and fire water. So there's no, no higher moral. It's just a, it's just a, you've, you've really ruined me as a person. I, I want my revenge type, type deal. Mm, Cause that's one of the things that makes it so interesting. And to, 
dare I use the P word, progressive, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> for, the, for the early 90s, because the, the Native Americans are shown as more complex and mm-hmm. yeah, some of them are exactly. trying to, to, you know, well, he specifically is wanting to look, see what the white man's doing. We can do that and we can have power. The scene in the village later on, he completely lays it all out, doesn't he? It's like, yeah. we can we can trade, we can be as powerful as the whites, etc. I think he says yeah. or something along those lines. Well, the tribes were, at yeah. least for a, for a time. Mm. I also really like the, the depiction of the Native Americans fully embracing firearms, which they yeah. did. Yeah. Because why wouldn't you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Whereas often, uh, and you know, we we often see them without, or maybe a couple have got you know, it's later on, and they've got some Winchesters or something. Mm. Um, well, yeah, you know, they kept what what worked for them, but they also adapted to what was new and capable, and they use it to great effect. So I, I can forgive some of the tired tropes of how British infantry are depicted. Yeah. But how the Indians are depicted. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. That's really a good point. Good. Really good. So as as usual, we've 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 crept into final thoughts while we were doing the final scenes and that's usually how it goes jonathan final thoughts one of many of my favorite films where the details a lot of the details are wrong and the more you look the more you'll see yeah the overall impression is just spot on and you feel like you're watching something from history For, for me i mean i really enjoyed it i wasn't i didn't expect a lot going in but i really really enjoyed it once the sort of initial half hour out the way get the ambush out the way get to the siege then i was invested early on i was like oh, okay where's this gonna go like i must admit I, I went off and made a cup of tea and came back so i had to i had to go back a little bit where i'd missed um so i missed the siege bit because i was like what they're in a fort now because I, I didn't know they'd moved on I was, you know to go back um there's a pause button i know there is but i, <laughs> I hit mute and i think it's pause and i come back and yeah that's that dangerous well. good god i know I know. Um, <laughs> as I say, it's, it's a Michael Mann film. I mean, if that doesn't sell it for you, if, you, if you're a fan of Heat, watch this. Yeah, this is 18th century Heat. It literally is. And if you're not, you should be. Yes, very true. For me, you know that on uh, on the head, John, when you said that it creates that overall impression of the period, and I think it does that really well. There's lots of little bits you could pick out. Um, you know, costume wise, it's quite good. But if you really zoom on it, um, you see like uh, some of the bits of uniform are a bit off. Um, some of the drills are, aren't correct, obviously. But that's a very difficult thing to do for a big production like this, in that it takes a desire to do that, you know, a desire to get every sort of minute thing right, which often isn't there with filmmaking. Um, but it does create that overall impression. Uh, and it's it's such an amazing piece of cinema in its its locations, its landscapes, and the way it shoots them. The depth of the choreography that goes into those you know those battles and those fight scenes so impressive. And then you get that brilliant sort of sweeping feel throughout the film, where it's it's a, a, a an epic adventure. You're you're following the, these people through a wilderness which it's also a wilderness that doesn't get explored very often it's it's the the frontier before everything moved west before the mid to late 1800s so you get this interesting landscape of it's woodland it's all feels very close and then it opens out into these massive lakes and over these rolling mountains it's just the location combined with the cinematography the the skill of filmmaking and that score just it's just a really great film so jonathan thank you so much for coming on i mean i for one have learned so much about 1700 weaponry um you know i think we 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 could have done two we could have done an episode on the film and an episode on the weapons on the film quite easily um, it's just been fantastic having you on and um, you can find jonathan on the he's on game spots youtube channel really great weapons d- detailed weapons videos on the um royal armory's channel um and we're just we're just really glad to have him today yeah, Jonathan, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. I knew it'd be a good one. And I, I, I knew it was going to be good because A, I love the film. And B, I know you love the film. And I knew that you'd have some brilliant things to say. And we definitely went on some tangents that I think everyone's going to really enjoy. We did. We didn't even get into what pattern of brown best they were using. <laughs> Quickly, what was it? Uh, well, it should be pattern 1742. 
but it appears to be 1756. <laughs> there you go. Well, there you Which go. is entirely too new and wouldn't have reached them. No, exactly. Correct. But the differences are incredibly minor. We'll have to get um, Jonathan back for another one because um, it's just been it's been great. So as always, uh, like, share, subscribe, wherever you're listening on. Uh, drop us a review if you if you do be so kind. Uh, you can uh, also support the podcast on Patreon, um, and you can find the link on our website, fightingonfilm.com. And uh, this is uh, the gang signing off again, and we'll catch you again in the next one. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, guys. <laughs>